Hey everybody, happy Thursday. I hope you're doing well. I want to read you a comment that was posted under a video, so I'm going to look at the screen here on the monitor and read it. It's under the video, Performance Coaching and Sticking to Your Game Plan. Uh, and it's uh, second entry long, I guess, is the name of the person who made this uh, comment, so thanks again for commenting. I have read your book, The Inner Voice Trading, and it's become one of my favorite ones. Thank you so much. I have been trying to find my inner voice and keep my losses small, but I have a recurring problem. While I do place protective stops every time I enter a trade, I find myself time and again moving the stops wherever, it probably means whenever, they are close to getting hit. Worse, I average losers and keep moving stops, and this has caused me to blow accounts time after time. What are your thoughts on possible reasons I do this? I am despondent, and your videos are about the only thing that give me hope. I know I have to find it within me. There are no external solutions to my internal problems. Someone smart said that, but maybe you can provide some guidance so I can get started with self-discovery on this. So in the consulting side of my, you know, uh, practice here, which is, you know, kind of a function of how much time I actually have to work with people, we start thinking about goals. Like, what is it that you want your money to do for you? Because typically having a goal in trading, if people say, yeah, I want to make a million dollars, I get it. If you don't have a million, it's probably a big goal for you. I understand. Depends on your upbringing too. So it could be good. But typically, it's a very vapid and empty kind of goal to have. Because what the hell does that even mean? And why pick a million? Why not just pick 50K? Because it's 20 times below, <laughs> right? It's an easier goal to hit. Yes, you have to get to 50 before you get to a million. So... I'd set the goal for 50. Um, but I think in, understand, in, in order to understand who you are, you have to understand what your money means to you. And in the beginning of your career, the money, if it's your money, right, it's really tuition. It's not even your trading grub stake. Yes, you can call it your trading grub stake. And yes, it's your money. You can zip it up and take it out and withdraw it and transfer it to a savings account. It's your money for sure. But when you're honing your craft, those are its points in the game. And yeah, I've been there, man. I've been in, in drawdowns because I didn't know what I was doing. And like I said, there were so many things where I'd make money in, in futures, but then give it back in foreign exchange, right? And, or I'd make it in stocks and futures, and then I'd lose it in options because I had one loser and I, you know, I bought a big debit balance, put her a call, and I let the thing go to expiration, which was stupid, but I didn't know any better. And it would wipe out the gains that I'd have in Deutschmarks or cotton. And so you kind of have to carve your behavior and figure out, like, how does it serve you to move your stops? What's the emotion, right? What is the emotion that you're unwilling to feel? Because those have as much power over you as the ones that you do want to feel. And so when you move your stop, I'm guessing it's because you don't want to feel the rejection or the humiliation or the frustration of having put in all, all this work. I don't know what quality of work you're putting in, but if you're putting in a lot of work, you might feel that you're owed some kind of due. I'm here to tell you that that's a fallacy. That doesn't work. No one cares how hard you're working. No one cares how hard I work either, by the way. The market is there to morph and to steal from you and to kill you and to take your money. That's why playing j defense is job number one. I don't care if you're hell-bent for election, balls-to-the-wall speculator. Job number one. Even for the commodities corporation guys, job number, if they lost their money, they were out, right? They had to actually reapply to get more money if they blew out their allocation. And it wasn't a fun process because I know the guys who, well, one since passed away, Frank Vanderson, but I know the three guys who were part of the management committee. And if they blew out of their allocation and had to reapply, it was a very arduous process and it was humiliating. So no one, no one has a free ride, no matter how they trade or their trading style or their asset class. So how much of your money are you willing to lose in order to learn your craft? Because you can't do it on paper, right? There's no burn. And I, su I, I suspect when you want to move your protective stops, it's because you're unwilling to feel the feelings that go around losing money. But to me, you have to fall in love with that feeling because it's going to be the most frequent feeling that you feel, right? Most people don't have a high winning percent for small gains. They have a, a smaller winning percent, like 30 to 50 percent for bigger gains, right? We talk about the expected value of a trade. Now, there are a handful of people, yeah, who have a high accuracy rate and high numbers. Uh, the problem is with day trading, there's not enough real, unless you catch a move because something like, 
last week, uh, some name was upgraded. It was up 15 bucks. You know, that's just being in the right place at the right time, right? So most of the time, though, you're going to find yourself being in trades. And uh, if they get close to your stop, what I used to do, I don't mean to jump all around here, but my mind's going a million miles an hour because I'm trying to think back over 35 years of experience so it can be valuable to you. So let's just say I bought a stock at 25 and for whatever reason, my stop is at 24, right? And if it wasn't making me money or it started to leak, you know, and my timing was off and it was, you know, 24.75 and then, because again, this was in eighths. So 24, five eighths, five eighths a half, right? Then three eighths a half. I would sell it at three eighths because I'm not going to let the thing come all the way down and stop me at 24 when I'm clearly, my timing's off. Because the better trades typically have a lot of slippage and skid and they start making money with you for you right away because you're buying when there's other buyers there. So if I put in an order to get it a big, you know, 2,000 shares at 25 on a stop and I get filled on all, 25, on all 2,000 shares at 25, my first reaction is, uh-oh, because that's not a good sign. Right? I want to see at least half of the fills go into an eighth to a quarter because now I'm on the right side. There's people who have enormous amount of size pushing the market higher. People are reluctant to sell. And there you have it. But I also used very, very early on, not at the very beginning, but very early on, like within my first two years, I also learned the importance of what we call time stops. And that would be where I look at the same name by 2000 at XYZ at 25. And over the next, like say that's a Monday, if like Wednesday-ish, Thursday, I'm like 24, 7, 5, 25, 25 and a quarter, and I'm not really seeing any movement, I unwind the trade. I don't care about the price because something stalled or the momentum never showed up that I thought was going to be there. And after diversification, we all need some level of momentum, even if you're not a momentum trader. You see? So part of this problem might be you don't know who you are as a person yet when it comes to money in general. I don't know what asset class and I don't know what kind of time frame you're trading. Um, but you might be looking at this as opposed to saying, okay, I have 10 trades and I'm going to lose six, seven times out of 10. And I'm going to take that failure very emotionally. And I'm unwilling to, I want to change that ratio. So I want to stay in the trade longer. So what do you do? You, you're coming down again. You're long at 25, it's 24 and 3 eighths. I know I'm using old language, but this is what I was going, going in my head when I was younger. And I would just basically say to myself, it's not wrong, I'm gonna preserve my cash because that's job number one. Sometimes I'd even blow it out at 24 and a half because you know, money was hard to come by. Plus, don't forget, the spreads were an eighth to a quarter. So it was like the thing was going 24 bid, I was going to get stopped. So I figured if it was 3 eighths to 5 eighths, the market, in, in other words, 24, 3 eighths bid offered at 5 eighths, I would sometimes call the market maker and say, I have 2,000 shares to sell at a half. Can we do it? And he'd say, yeah. And I'd be like, okay, I took my 50 cent loss, again, plus the commissions, which were astronomic compared to what you're all paying today. So I learned the importance of playing superior defense. If you're frustrated with the frequency with which you're losing, then you have to trade smaller and get into some kind of a groove and do it with a small amount of capital because anyone can scale. Once you figure out what works and who you are and what works for you, then that's, it's easy to scale. But I wouldn't be trading your optimal size at the beginning if you don't know what your edge is. And again, if you don't know what your edge is, then there's no reason to trade at all. We only want to trade when there's an edge. But Mike, I'm just starting. I don't know what my edge is. All the more reason to trade smaller. Risk 10 bucks. One of my buddies who runs a prop firm, I don't know because I haven't spoken with him in a bit. Probably owe him a call. Um, I think they only let their traders lose 10 bucks at the very beginning. And I'm like, this is brilliant. Smart idea. Because it doesn't say anything about the person, right? You know, if you're looking to print wins where there's a comma, you'll get there. But not if you blow up. Right, if, unless you, again you make enough money where you can just roll the dice and and bet half your account because you make four hundred k a year, then it really doesn't matter. You don't need to trade, right? That's just like an ego win. So I would trade small, 
and really evaluate your process, keep good records as to what you what kind of trades you're putting on, why you're putting them on. And also understand what do you what does money mean to you? Who taught you the rules around money? Right? Because unless those people were, you know, Ray Dalio, you might not know anything about money. You know, and that's not a dig. You know, if you come from a working class background and those folks were living check to check to check, they might not have even had an investment account. Their biggest investment is probably their house. You see? So you inadvertently learn these rules around money and how to take chances. You could be super academic where you think of lo- losing money as a failure because you live in an, or you come from and have been reinforced. Look, by the time you graduate high school for 12 years, you've been conditioned to think that being correct is good and being wrong is failure. So if you lose money on trades, you associate that with failure, which it's not. That's how, it's how the game works. So get clear on what your money means to you and what you want your money to do for you. And it's typically not a dollar value. It's usually associated with what you can do with that money. Does it give you liberty? Do you want to be a philanthropist and give it away? Do you want to convert it to a different asset class and create passive income that might have more favorable tax treatment than buying and selling securities on a listed exchange? I don't have enough information here. Let me just go back. Yeah, I don't... I don't, I don't have enough information to know about the asset class or whatever. I appreciate all the compliments. But again, you're despondent because you're breaking your own rules when you probably know better. And I don't mean to sound that way, but you know, this is, your, this is what you wrote. Don't change your stop. Trade smaller and give it more room, right? Because if you're trading 2,000 shares risking a dollar, right, trade, that would be the same equivalent, right, of, tra- of trading a tenth of the size, 200 shares, and giving it all m- that much more room. So do the math and figure it out. Give yourself more room to breathe, right? Or even, and then cut it in half, right? Isn't that what Bruce Kovner said in Market Wizards? Whatever you think your right position size is, cut it in half and then cut it in half again. This is probably the smartest thing written in any of those books, right? Trade small at the beginning because until you can define your edge, there's really no reason to trade. If you're panhandling for the gold because you're just getting started, yes, it's true. You have to be in the business. I'll leave you with this. I don't know enough about these funding accounts. They come across as terribly slippery. I'll give you that much. And I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. I did an episode on it. Chances are you're getting, if the winners, they're getting paid out on other people who are paying their monthly fees, right? Because I don't think there's actually any trading going on. It's all paper trading. And somehow they're netting out the books. Sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes you need a bunch of green days in a row of 100 bucks, five of them before you get paid from this one outfit. I was going to say racket, but I'm not being condescending. I don't know who many of these people are. But it might make sense for some of you. And again, I don't have any financial stake. I don't have any affiliate commissions. So truth is, I just don't even care if the funding companies exist or not, to be frank with you. But if you don't have money, and if if it bothers you to lose your own money, it might make sense for you to investigate one of these funding accounts traded super small and super conservatively, right? Again, there's a lot of rules that I don't like about them. Like you make 9,000, you can't have more than a $3,000 drawdown. Well, I would never make it, even today. I would never pass with those rules. Because if I have 9K in gains, I might be willing to risk 4,500 of that to stay in a winning trade. It might not work for you. I get it. It's different emotional constitution. So imagine I come out, I'm super lucky. I buy a bunch of NQs. I'm up 13K. And I want to ride my winners, but I draw it down to nine. Guess what? I got to reset because I lost 4K and I was only allowed 3K in the program. That's a bad rule, right? I think that's Apex, by the way, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think that's a bad rule. If you're making money, and, and, and it's, especially it's on paper, right? So, <laughs> but it might make sense for you to look at having a small monthly fee, don't go after the big three, four hundred, half a million dollar account sizes because it makes you feel bigger. Trade the smallest one possible and learn your craft. Pay the smallest amount a month that you possibly can because that's like a call option or a put option. It was a call option, right? Because it's a set monthly fee. It's paper trading. You're not really losing any of your money and you're able to learn your craft. 
I do think it's not exactly the same though because you're not feeling the burn of losing money. The benefit of what you're going through right now of actually losing your own money and being despondent goes to the quote from Anais Nin. And then the day came when the pain it took to remain tight in a ball was greater than the pain it took to flourish. Sooner or later, all this despondency is going to motivate you to stop making bad decisions and moving your stops, right? And I say that not to be sarcastic or, or snarky, because I've been there. There's no feeling that you're going to have to feel or will feel or have felt that I haven't felt for one reason or another. We might not have come, the orientation to those feelings might, from our behavior might not be the same, but I know what it feels like to be despondent. So the key is to lose less. How do you do that? Trade smaller, trade not frequently, trade one of these funding accounts. Again, I don't endorse any of them because I don't know them, but at least you're not really losing your money at that point. Then if you can determine that you have a small edge, go to the cash market where you're using your own money and um, you know start there. But f- identify your edge. And if you don't have an edge, just understand that you're going to roll the dice and you're going to crap out. It's the way it works. No one's immune from it, okay? Anyway, please like and subscribe and click the little bell thingy so that you get notified. I appreciate you in here. Keep all your comments coming because it's really good. It kind of keeps this conversation going. And I appreciate you all being here very much. And I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, everybody, thanks for being here. Please take a minute, like and subscribe to the show. You could also leave a comment. I don't have all the answers, so it's good to get some feedback. Also, if you would like to support the show, check out the links below. You can get the free audio book of The Inner Voice of Trading. Uh, and also information about the course that I teach with Victor Spirandio. Thanks for being here, folks. I'll see you tomorrow.